Welcome back to the First Gnostic Church of Christ. We are continuing our read and commentary, The Secret Book of John. This is video four in the series. The last video, I brought forth further clarification and definition of a number of terms that we've already run into in the first seven verses of this very mystical, enigmatic book. So I'm going to do a very quick rundown again of that because it is important that you hear these terms very often so you become familiar with them. As I know this is new to many of you listeners. In the very beginning, the secret book of John, John is met by Arimanius, who is a Pharisee that puts doubt in John's heart, asking him, where is the Christ? Make John doubt if the Christ is ever going to return, because this is after Christ has publicly been put on the cross. And being that Arimanius is a Pharisee, it's really a redundant question, rhetorical question. Uh, he knows where the Christ went. He knows that Christ died. But from Arimanius' perspective, he doesn't believe in resurrection. He doesn't believe believe in the spirit. He only believes in death and judgment by the Old Testament God. Furthermore, he puts into his heart the idea that John has betrayed his own people. John then is disheartened and goes to the desert and starts to question himself. And He's left with a lot of questions. Where is the Christ now? What is the aeon? What is pleroma? What is the afterlife like? When will we go there? Things like this. And while in the desert, Christ visits him and starts to explicate on the history of humanity, the beginning of all things and our origins, essentially. He starts out with the idea of the Father from the beginning known as the monad. Some within Gnostic teaching or other books called the Bythos, which is the beginning of all things, where the monad resides. And from there, the monad emanates the first thought, also known as Berbello. It is from Berbello that God is able to create a vessel by which he can then bring forth all his thoughts and creations. Barbello asks Monad for three aspects to thought, which are known as the triple male, which include foreknowledge, pronoia, and protonoia. And these are all terms that, if you're not familiar with, I would suggest you go back and listen to the previous video where I clarify very clearly what each of these words mean. Essentially, just know that foreknowledge is pretty much like intuition. Pronoia is the opposite, paranoia, and the idea that the universe is conspiring in your favor through knowledge and gnosis rather than paranoia, which is the belief that evil forces and bad things are conspiring against you, which is a much more cynical approach and idea of how the universe works at large. You could say that the proto-Orthodox Christians have a much more cynical idea of who God is in the heavens, will work against you if you don't follow exactly its dictates. In Gnosticism, we say that everybody is free to practice their own experience toward Gnosis and ultimately to return back to the Pleroma and receive eternal life and blessings from the True Father in the Pleroma. And then we have Protonoia, which is the extension of knowledge throughout the universe, and this is done by humankind's coming to this realm called the Kenoma, the flesh realm, in order to gain further wisdom uh, through Gnosis and gain wisdom and experience, and that then extends that Gnosis out further, and not only in the universe as we know it, but also extending our understanding of the true Father and the ineffable. Then we went into uh, the creation of the, the mother, father, son, which is the Christ, also known as the autogens, who is able to create or invocate from within, does not need something outside itself to be able to generate its will. This Christ asks for its own gifts, which include will and mind, as well as being able to carry out the Word of God through work. And the work is what every one of us must ultimately attain and to achieve. And that work is essentially personal to each individual. They're finding their own pathway back to God, and they have their own contribution here in the Kenoma that is going to also assist fellow brethren and sisters back to the Pleroma. But in so doing, they'll add to the understanding of God as a whole, as every individual is bringing a personal experience and a personal side to God um, that is unique to them, has a unique expression, and a further understanding of God in that unique way that becomes their name and what they're known for in all of time. And each human within this realm is influencing each other in that way. At least those that have uh, gnosis and uh, the understanding of the pleroma are doing it to bring more light into this realm and understanding, to grow the Christ energy that was brought first to us, the first begotten Son, Christ, to this realm called the Matrix, or the realm of the God or the Demiurge, the Demigod known as the Demiurge, known also by the four elements of this earth incarnation known as Jehovah, the four letters of the Hebrew sacred name of the four elements. And from there, Christ then uh, goes about and has aeons around him, uh, also known as angels in the 
Canoma realm, but in the Pleroma, they're known as aeons, which are spans of time, not in a chronological or chronicle type way, but in an experiential way or archetypical way. So we say they are they are aeons of experience, and those aeon aeons of experience have their own also parallel examples here in the Canoma, known as astrological ages, such as the age of Pisces, the age of Aquarius, so forth and so on. Christ was the beginning of the age of Pisces, which was the age of grace and then the age of man which is the age of transcending or understanding the tree of knowledge of good and evil is the age of Aquarius and we must understand again as I said in prior videos the age of uh, or the tree of knowledge of good and evil is different from the tree of good and evil the tree of good and evil is offered to us by the demiurge and those that accept it came from the pleroma to this realm to experience that fruit uh, from that tree which is the, not, uh, the tree of good and evil so the tree of good and evil is offered by the demiurge and we partook of it by coming to this realm to experience both good and evil which is life and death and then the tree of knowledge of good and evil is something altogether different the demiurge wants to keep us in the dark about that tree uh, so that we we don't recall making that contract Christ's body is known as the tree of knowledge of good and evil which is gnosis essentially when you partake of that tree you then wake up and you realize that you've partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and the consequences thereof then there's the tree of life which is the tree of eternal life is when you have the desire to detach yourself uh, from this realm and the way in which you do that is to take from the last supper which means that you eat of your body and your soul just as Christ did as an example to follow and remembrance of him and the way in in which you follow that way is also to give up your body and spirit or rather your body and your soul to release your spirit back to the paroma by detaching from any needs in this realm and that can be achieved in one lifetime uh, although for most people it's achieved through many lifetimes uh, perhaps even hundreds of lifetimes as we have much here that we need to find to make ourselves whole and eventually get back to the pleroma I, I also brought Fourth, that it is important to understand that the Demiurge has created a facsimile here in the Kenoma that we reside in as a means to copycat the God, the True Father, and is doing this as a way to sort of dethrone the True Father in the Pleroma, and has done this by having the light of God shining, uh, shining as on the ceiling, if you will, of where the Demiurge resides, known as heaven, and saw through that light a vague image of the pleroma that existed above that firmament or that water that separated the pleroma from the heavens and so the ninth heaven going into the pleroma there is indeed a border that exists between the pleroma and uh, the heavens that the demiurge resides in now the thing you have to remember is that we we don't know if that's metaphorical or if that's spiritual um, demarcation, or that's a physical demarcation, or all three, and ultimately it doesn't really matter. Uh, the main thing here is for you to have some type of image of that so you understand how everything fits together and how the Demiurge was able to take that light that it received uh, from that separation between the Pleroma and the heavens that the Demiurge resides in and was able to create this enormous cosmos that we reside in, this material cosmos. So just being able to see that light can give you the enormous immensity of the True Father's powers. So even the Demiurge was able to create this incredibly complex and mind-blowing universe uh, just by being able to experience the light of God. Can you imagine then what the True Father had intended for us from the beginning, which would have superseded anything that we're experiencing here in the cosmos? The reason I bring that forth is to understand that in this realm, the Demiurge rules by creating things, forming things, and through astral theology, or what's called elements, the four elements. So that's why Jehovah appeared as the four elements of the Hebrew God. And then you have in the Pleroma, that true father does not rule but is able to give all of its light to all of humanity through emanations and the four lights so the four lights are paralleled to the four elements in the kanoma and then the emanation or emanating is parallel to creating or forming in the kanoma or the material realm so that's what you have and then we're going to now get into the breakdown of those lights those four lights 
which are overseen by four aeons. Now, what you have to understand also is in the Pleroma, things are not hierarchical, so they're not vertical. They are, in fact, horizontal, so everybody's equal to one another, and there, no one is more or less than someone else. There's no lord over someone else or a commander of sorts, but there is merely everyone having a part to play that's essential, like cogs in a watch, for example, and they're all equally important to the end result. In the hierarchical system that exists here in the Kenoma, that's completely not the case. In fact, you are dispensable. Uh, there's no real utility to you other than being much like a battery. And we're going to talk about that. The Matrix, the movie Matrix, is not off about the purpose of why the demurrage can't just wipe everybody out that doesn't agree with it. We'll get to that as we continue to read into other Gnostic texts, and you'll be able to understand why we've come to understand the purpose behind it, uh, why the demurrage uh, needs needs us and doesn't just get rid of us just like that. Now along the way of course Barbello creates the perfect human and then there are four different types of humans in the Pleroma. In the Canoma there are three types of humans and that's the triple male that is the parallel to Barbella which is the container of God's vessel. So the three men also, the three triple male, is the container here in this realm that are the three types of humans that bring forth the demiurge's will or intent. But ultimately, all of this is God's intent. Uh, whether the demiurge wants to admit it or not, ultimately it doesn't matter because it will all go back to the purpose of what God intended from the beginning. And the way in which the Christ or the uh, True Father is able to do this is through the autogenes known as Christ and through the four lights. And those four lights have also their three states. And in the Pleroma, those three states are known as the modalities that we get in astral theology, which include cardinal, fixed, and mutable. In the Canoma, those three states are not they are lights that emanate from the true father through the, the mother and the Christ and through the four aeons which are the four four lights and they are the uh, equivalent to the four elements in the Kanoma but the three modalities in the spiritual realm of the Pleroma are the three expressions or emanations of those four lights so each of the four lights have three uh, expressions and that totals four times three which equals a total of twelve expressions under or standing by the Christ. Now those twelve are came to along with Christ when he came to walk on this earth as the twelve apostles. Along with that in the Kenoma, the astral theological model that the Demiurge utilizes is the twelve powers uh, which are the twelve zodiac signs and he uses the will of life in order to capture the spirit beings that we are and to entrap us in the dark form or the dark light, or not the dark light, but the dark material substance that we live in. And so when Christ talks about man walks in darkness and knows it not, he's not referring to evil, he's referring to a state of being. And that darkness is the absence of the light that is the true father. That's what he's referring to that leads to death and suffering. And so this is important to understand because in the Pleroma, these different three different uh, states of the light, of the four lights, are equivalent to the 12 zodiac signs. And what you have to understand is that there are four different states of the human being chronologically in the Pleroma, but not hierarchically, but chronologically, horizontally, so that the first element is the earth element, is the uh, perfect human. That is actually flipped, or the perfect light is the earth light. Now, that's actually flipped in the Kenoma, where Malkuth is the lowest expression, Kabbalistic tree, in the Kenoma, is low, known as the rudimentary, dense, and substance known as the earth, or Malkuth. The human man, or the earth man, is known as the beast man, or the lowest man. And then he goes up from there to the water man, and then the fire man, and air man. So this is how this works in the Kenoma. It's flipped 180, and it's on a hierarchical system. So it's not only flipped, but it's also changed 180 on its pole from being horizontal to vertical, north to south pole. So this is what the Demiurge has done. It's completely twisted everything around. So that's why you have the reverse pinnacle. The pinnacle is not just the pinnacle within the circle that's been twisted, but also the circle itself has been twisted. The other thing to understand is we talked about Satan and the planet Saturn and Sabbath, and they all interrelate with Satan, those that worship the Sabbath and Satan and so forth and so on. 
Saturn God, which is the Demiurge or Jehovah God. The uh, reason I bring this forth is because this is the, the planet that rules Capricorn, which is the sign, zodiac sign that is about realism, the taskmaster in law and judgment brought forth through the Jewish people or the Judean people. We get the word uh, judicial, judge, uh, things like this. And Levitical, we get the word law from. So these are things that you have to remember uh, so that you understand how things are set up in this realm, the Kanoma. So Christ came to bring forth the understanding that the God of the Old Testament was in fact Satan, was the divider or the uh, adversary, was the one that was doing this as a taskmaster. So that's why it's also known as the God of the air and fire. Let's pick up from there. Hopefully I didn't confuse it too much, but I wanted to you to understand before we go any further that these 12 tw zodiac signs and astral theology are not uh, in some way more or less than the other just because for example if you have an earth sign in the astral theology even though it's known as the uh, lowest light uh, or the lowest form or the lowest element in the kanoma it's flipped 180 because in the pleroma it's known as the not the highest but the last expression of mankind the last kind of like achieving the goal the end of the race so to speak is that getting back to the pleroma is back to the earth element or known, known as harmazel and again that's because the demiurge is trying to keep us as far away from the truth as possible and again this does not somehow suggest that if you're one sign versus the other that you are somehow superior or that you are more enlightened or you have more gnosis because everybody has all the elements in them that's what you have to understand. What your zodiac sign tells you so that you're coming here to practice that, it's like you've been given a set of instructions and it's been put sort of in your DNA uh, so that you can practice being that and the challenges that come with it. It's not as though you're a Aries and so you're bringing in all the Aries traits uh, because you already have them. Rather, it is that you are ready to take on the Aries because that's your contract because it's leading toward your fulfillment as a spiritual being. And that's what you've chosen to come into this realm, back into this incarnation as, as an Aries. And that doesn't mean you already naturally are an Aries uh, and you've got all the strengths of an Aries, but it means instead Instead, that you have the gnosis, you have the understanding, but you don't have the wisdom. You've been taught about Aries by the higher mind, and you've been given that gift, but you've got to now practice it as an Aries on this plane. And it's going to be up to you to determine if you can make something good of it or bad of it. Um, that's up to you. And good and bad is relative, in, even in the Pleroma, but when I talk about good or bad, I mean, are you going to suffer or are you going to have freedom from bondage and suffering? Are you going to move closer to the light and closer to eternal life? Or are you going to move closer to death and suffering and continual bondage and attachment to this realm? Neither one of these paths is right or wrong in the eyes of the true father. It really is up to you. Uh, and the point at which you'll decide that you're going to detach is the point at which you have found your full self. And in addition to no longer um, having the patience for this realm, no longer having desire for this realm, being able to see through the facade and all the attachments and seeing like seeing through it and just have an apathy toward it and the point that which you just don't have a desire to be attached to it anymore because the desire to go back to the diploma supersedes that the passion now that doesn't mean you're apathetic in this life you have passion to bring the light to this realm and to the point at which you are going to go to the cross so to speak to sacrifice it's not just a matter of the passion to get back to the diploma but it's also that the ultimate position you must take as the last supper that's why it's called the last supper is you must eat of the bread and the wine which is your body and your soul which means you have to give it up you have to let it be consumed into the kanoma and the dark matter has to be left behind and con consumed and then the light has to go back to the pleroma. That's that's the understanding of the Last Supper here on the First Gnostic Church of Christ. This material is extremely dense and I will have to repeat it to you many, many times and that's why each video may be a good 10-15 minute introduction, rehearsing everything that we've already gone over prior. It's important for you to understand these basic fundamental terms and concepts and ideas and metaphors and allegories, so forth and so on, because these are building blocks to the culmination of how this book uh, is woven together. So now let's pick up from verse 8, and I always remind you that you're always welcome to ask questions if you need further clarification. Verse 8, it says, For from the light, which is the Christ, and that's the thing you have to remember is that there are four lights but they are part of the Christ 
And Christ is an archetype again. It's not a being. The aeon known as Christ, the being itself, is the Son of God. Now, it doesn't really have a name. It has a uh, intention or a name as in its uh, character, not in that it's like here in this realm, your name is Joe or you, you work at um, uh, Whole Foods or whatever. It's not like that. It's not what you do, uh, but it's, it's your character, it's your being. The essence of your intention that shines forth, that's the Christ, that's the light. And it's made up of four other lights that stand before it. And those four lights are separate in themselves because they have their own wills and purpose. And they're, they're doing their own individual work through those four lights. For from the light, which is the Christ, and indestructibility, again, these indestructibility is one of the characteristics of the monad or the ineffable, if you recall. And uh, through Barbella, through the gift of the Spirit, he gazed out so as to cause the four lights from the divine origins to stand before him. And the three are will, thought, and life. Now, these are the three states that are talked about, or the three modalities that are parallel in the Kanoma. In the Pleroma, they're known as will, thought, and life. But in the Kanoma, in the astral theological model by which the Demiurge works through, will is, fix, is the fixed modality. Thought is the mutable modality. And life is the cardinal modality. Cardinal is the initiator, so life is, initiates everything. Will is fixed. It has something it wants to accomplish, so it, it's focused, and it's not going to change or alter from that will if it's going to do its work and keep its word. And thought is always challenging and wanting to extend and pretend and also to promote itself. So it's always going out to want to seek out more and more not knowledge, uh, through knowledge and gnosis and wisdom and to... Those are the three that are under thought. Oh, it wants to experience those three. So it's constantly going out there to find them. And so it's mutable. And so then, and the four powers are understanding, grace, perception, and prudence. Now, it is grace which dwells in the light aeon Armazil. Grace is the equivalent to the earth element in the Kanoma or the Matrix realm. Now, again, these are these may differ from different uh, Gnostic teachers, so that's what you have to understand. But I'm going to give you my own understanding of these texts, and there's no need to be too hung up on if it's this or that. More importantly, it's getting to know yourself through your own lens, because some degree of how you understand and perceive things is your truth. Uh, even though there is an objective truth, we also each have our subjective tr truth, and they combine each other together to form your understanding of truth. And there is both an objective truth, but there's also a subjective truth, what, which I call the influential truth, because that is going to influence your reality field, and it, it's just going to be the way it is. It's not the only way, but it's an amalgamation of how you see things and also the way things are. But anyway, this is the earth element, uh, also known as grace. Now, when you see a word like grace, you're going to understand that it's most likely the fixed sign. There's a lot of reasons why I support that idea, and you're going to see that not only in Gnostic texts, but you're going to see that in conical text as to why the fixed signs are usually the ones leading the way in the elements. And because that is at its pinnacle, think of the sine wave, the highest point would be the fixed sign or the lowest point. So those are the peaks or the nadars of that wave. That's what it is most known for. It's reached its highest expression. So that's why it's the fixed sign, the primary light among those three types. And so will, thought, and grace. So you could say that grace is equivalent to one of the wills, or one of the uh, the three types, and I would say it's probably will, because as I said, grace is mentioned again under Armazil. Who is the first angel also, an a angel um, or aeon? Three other aeons are with this aeon, and see, this is what I'm saying. Grace, truth, form. In addition to Armazil, who's the first angel, and three other aeons are with this aeon, grace, truth, and form. So Armazil is a light of Christ. He's not one of those three aeons, grace, truth, and form, but he represents the element of earth. And under that angel is those three zodiac signs. And grace would represent Taurus, and Taurus is ruled by the planet of Venus, or its planet is Venus, which is a planet of grace. And truth would be Capricorn, as it's ruled by Saturn. And Saturn is the planet always seeking for you to be tr a truth teller and to be real to yourself. And then form, which is Virgo, as Virgo is ruled by Mercury, and Mercury is shape-shifting. So this is form. And forms can take many uh, many shapes, right? So that's the first light. Uh, the second light is Ariel, is the one who was established over the second Aeon. 
astrotheological uh, equivalent to that would be water. And three other aeons are with him. And we talked about all of these uh, also um, about what element they represent, and um, but also what's their name. And in this case, this one's perception. This angel is called perception or resides, is over the element of water. And so the, the three along with that include pranoia, perception, and memory. Those angels, they also sometimes call them conceptualization, perception, and memory. So also sometimes called epinoia. And so conceptualization, also known as pranoia, or the promotion of knowledge, which is concepts that we are able to promote knowledge through, is Pisces, the equivalent to Pisces. Pisces are the ones that are out to discover concepts and ideas that are bigger than the current reality field. The next one is perception, which is Scorpio, which is the investigator, uh, is making sense of what it perceives and is very perceptive. And then Cancer, which is ruled by the moon, is known as the memory bank, or um, which is the sign of the mother or the soul. Uh, so bank, which is memory. And the third light is Devi Tai, the one who was established, or the third aeon. And the equivalent here is the angel of the fire element and the uh, astrotheological model in the Kanoma, who manifests as the three other aeons with him, which are understanding, love, and lightness. And sometimes that's called understanding, love, and idea. And the first one, understanding, is Sagittarius. And Sagittarius is the philosopher. It's ruled by the planet of Jupiter, which is also a planet of understanding understanding, and it's constantly seeking to understand the universe through philosophy, through adventures and experience. Love, which is Leo, and Leo is challenged through ego to be able to give its light rather than be stingy with its light and need drama and uh, attention. And it's ruled by the planet, or, or known as the sun. It's also called a planet in astrotheology, but that's the giving sun, which is always giving its light, love. And then likeness is Aries. Aries, also known as idea. Aries is constantly going out to um, try to find or bring forth an idea image that it has in its mind. So Athena is also considered to be one of the goddesses or gods that are with Aries and she's the god of the mind uh, or the god of law through the mind. And so it's constantly um, focused on a uh, idea that it has and it's sparked by that idea and the likeness of that idea. So it's the one that's constantly probably going to be intrigued by uh, color, colorful lights and things like that and may be really excited at first and maybe peter out later. That's ideas. And then the fourth one, which is the element of air, is a Lilith, and she's the aeon of consideration and wisdom, the angel of the air elemental. And here it says that, and the fourth aeon was established over the fourth light, a Lilith, and the three aeons with him are, and again, you have to remember aeons are androgynous, so they can be, uh, they can be called he or she, and they'll more likely be a she or a he based upon what predominates in the way humans understand them, not so much the, the way they actually are in the Pleroma, but humans' experience of them and our own destiny uh, re relative to that aeon. So mainly humans think of a Lilith as feminine in nature because that's the expression she brings to, or gift she brings to humanity, a, a feminine expression. And we'll get to know her a little better as we go along further into more Gnostic texts. The three aeons with him or her are perfection, peace, and wisdom. And the first one is perfection, and that's Gemini, who is always wanting to seek out more and more knowledge to understand something perfectly. And so it's ruled by the planet Mercury as well, that you also get that perfectionistic quality by Virgo that's more inwardly perfectionistic, whereas the Gemini is more outwardly perfectionistic. That's why it can get into fits of uh, gossip and things like that, because it's always trying to call out things uh, in order to try to put it to the light uh, to see if there's any dirt on it, so to speak. So it's looking for perfection, and that's the equivalent of Gemini in the Kanoma. And peace is Libra, which is always looking for balance and harmony. And then wisdom is Aquarius, and we're entering into the age of experiencing the knowledge of the, the uh, tree of good and evil, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is actual gnosis and action. So we're in that, we're beginning that age. Some argue that the beginning of that age was the event of the internet. Some will say it's 2012. But nonetheless, it's somewhere around that, give or take. It's a, quite a big number, but it's about 100 years. 
around the year 2000. Uh, so wisdom is Aquarius, as Aquarius is ruled by Uranus, and Uranus is the um, planet of technology, friendship, and also opposites that um, are open to experiencing the um, opening doors to the forbidden as well. That's Aquarius, the rebel. And uh, so through that experience, we get Sophia, and that ultimately leads to wisdom. And so we're now beginning to discover the fullness of Christ's message in this age is the beginning. So you're part of a church, it could be this church or any other Gnostic church that's uh, Christ-oriented, that is going to be growing tremendously over the next 2,000 years. All right, so then these are the four lights who stand before the divine autogens. These are the 12 aeons, or 12 disciples, also known as or the 12 apostles, and then the Pleroma, the 12 zodiac signs, which stand before the son of the great autogens, Christ. And Christ is the crystallizing force in the universe that's governed by Logos, which is the governing power of the will of the true father mother through the will and the gift of the invisible spirit and that's what i was talking about and the will is the father part the gift is the vessel mother the give it, giving herself up so that we may experience wisdom through Barbella, sometimes expressed through Sophia as well. And the 12 aeons belong to the son of the autogens. And who is that uh, son of the autogens? The son of the autogens is every one of us. So those aeons belong to us. They are each one of us, as well as in the Pleroma, our higher selves. But these aeons also are another expression onto themselves. So remember what I said in a previous video that in this realm, we think of ourselves as very separate, uh, but we don't realize that we're all working in unison together in consort to create a society and even a planet or a species known as the human race. Each one of us, whatever we do, add, have an additive effect as a collective that results in an outcome as a human species. And that has a more resounding impact on the way we're perceived than by, say, an alien coming down, than what each one of us do on an individual basis. So that's the way you have to think of the Pleroma. The Pleroma, each one of the aeons can be anywhere and shapeshift in anything. Each one of the aeons based upon what they express. For example, perfection can be anywhere. Peace can be anywhere. Wisdom can be found anywhere. And where those concepts and ideas exist or those archetypes exist, then there they are. So that's what you have to understand. They're, they're actual entities with their own consciousness and they have their own expression. And when you bring forth a new introduction into the Kenoma of a concept or idea that pre did not previously exist, then you too can become an Aeon. But that's an incredible task. That's even beyond go back to the Pleroma. Christ was the first to achieve that, um, to be the son the first begotten son um, that was also the perfect human. So he was the first perfect human and then he came to this realm and then went back. And the other thing you have to remember is that in the Kanoma, it's not the same as in uh, the Pleroma. In the Kanoma, when we talk about time, we think of it as this happens first, then B happens, then C happens. It's not the way it happens in the Pleroma. It's not confined by time and space. The way it happens is all these experiences happen at the same time, and they express themselves through the Kanoma chronologically, but in the Pleroma, they are existing all the time in different amalgamations. Think about like if you have a big um, bucket of water and you're pouring different colors of Kool-Aid in it. You're mixing it up. Well, those different colors are floating around all over the place. But say it's an internal size bucket. So you're never going to be able to completely mix all of these together. But they are forming a total picture. If you were, a bit, were able to go really high in the sky and look down, you see all these different colors floating around all over the place. And it'd be a beautiful picture, right? That's the way it works. Um, in the Pleroma. So it's not based on something that's the way we think of time and space. It's different. Uh, so when we talk about the Christ coming to earth, it's not in the Pleroma, it's not chronological. It's not as though Christ was, for, you know, chronologically in the heavens for, or in the Pleroma first, and then through, some, you know, time passed in the Pleroma, and then he came to earth. It d doesn't work that way. It Already simultaneously, everything was happening uh, because the Christ was an expression. It was humans that made it into something chronological it, because we were able to accept the Christ at a certain time in our evolutionary chronological uh, unfolding. So I know it's really hard to understand that, but that's how it is in the, the Pleroma. It's spiritual. It's not material or so oriented. So it's a completely different realm. It has a completely different set of governance and way of being. All right, I'm going to go up through verse 9 because when we get into verse 10, we're going to be entering into another territory. Uh, we bring forth this, the introduction of Sophia, which is a very crucial, very crucial element to the understanding of Gnosticism. Verse 9, and the all, which of course is the monad or the ineffable, was firmly founded through the will of the Holy Spirit. And 
the will is done through the Christ. And remember, Christ had three things that was to complete or, or uh, for the true Father, which is will, work, and word. And so through the Christ, the, the will of the Holy Spirit is brought forth, which is the Father, Mother. That's the Holy Spirit through autogens. And from foreknowledge, and remember foreknowledge is one of the gifts that the monad bestowed upon Barbello by request, and that's also known as uh, intuition or instinct, so forth and so on, of the perfect mind, and remember mind is the container that Christ requested to fulfill the will of God. We each have to have a mind, right, to be able to receive the will of God. It's the container, so it's the feminine aspect or the uh, the uh, androgen pair to will, which is the mind. Through the revelation of the will of the invisible spirit and the will of the autogens, the invisible spirit named the perfect man or the perfect human, the first revelation of the truth, Pagira Adamus. And this is the first perfect human. And it set him up over the first aeon with the great autogens Christ beside the first light, Armazil, and his power dwelled with him. So what you have to understand is that not only is this perfect human the highest form, not, not in a hierarchical sense, but in an expression sense, because there's no judgment in the Pleroma. There merely is a state of being, meaning that this is eternal, and it's whole, and it's complete. Now, that doesn't mean it can't have more experiences. It can have eternal experiences, but it's found itself, and now it only needs to discover God more. Now, only thing we're doing now is, on this realm, is we're looking inward. We're trying to discover the God in us, and then once we've fulfilled that, and we've gone back to Pleroma, then we can look outward to the God that exists all around us, okay? So that's the, that's the way it works, and so the perfect human has reached that fullness of finding the God, the full God within them. And each one of us have a piece of God that is unique, a unique part of God. But we all are unitary in, in that we are all part of God, right? So that's what we're all here to find, that part of that part of God, to add to the understanding that Sophia wanted from the beginning, that asked from the True Father. Okay, so that's, the, that's how the design works. And so then the first aeon with the great Autogen's Christ is not just full in its light and understanding of its Godship or its uh, name, or its uh, understanding of its unique expression of God. But in addition to that, it is set up over the first aeon. Now, did you hear that? It supersedes the first aeon, Armazil. It's over it. Now, that doesn't mean that that it's superior to or that it's um, a lord over. But what it does mean is that it's more full of the understanding of God than even that aeon. Those individuals that's able to, res uh, to reach the perfect human, they are not just over that first aeon, but they're with Christ, and beside the first light, Armazil, and its powers dwelled with him. And the invisible one gave him an unconquerable intellectual power. Remember what I said in the last video, what is intelligence? It's the capacity to take in information and make sense of it, right? It doesn't just look like a bunch of numbers on a, on a piece of paper or letters that make no sense to you. You can actually make sense of it and create a logic around it. That's intelligence and have awareness about it having some kind of meaning. And he spoke and glorified and praised the invisible spirit, saying, Because of you and the all came into being, and it is to you that the all will return. It's talking about all of existence. It's going to return back to the emanator in time. And I will praise and glorify you and autogens with the three aeons, the mother, the, the father, the child, the perfect power. The three are those, and they are together, collectively known as the perfect power. And it is set up his child, Seth, over the second aeon, beside the second light, Ario. Now, this is another significant part, and we're going to learn more about Seth in another one of the Gnostic books, but just understand that Seth was known as the third child of Adam and Eve, and it was the, considered by some Gnostics to be at least more so, uh, very much so among Sethians, to be the only true son of Adam and Eve. The other two Persethians believe that Abel and Cain were seeds of the Lord God, or Jehovah God, that walked in the garden, uh, forced himself upon Eve, and brought forth Cain and Abel. And so they're of the seed that have corruption. And Seth is the seed that carried the light of Christ, and the understanding of Gnosis through it and guarded it secretly. So that's why it's known as the secret Seth, or the secret sect of Seth, and carried that knowledge with it through time to guard it, to bring that knowledge into the age of Pisces or when Christ arrived onto into earth. So that's, um, you know, year zero in the, here in the Western world. So that Seth is over the second light or is uh, over the second aeon beside the second light, Ario. We're going to come to understand how the, each one of these are significant. But the other thing I want to remind you of, remember that the first one uh, is equivalent to the astrological model at to earth element and the second one here is equivalent to the water element and this is all will become 
significant as well. This is the ones that have gone through the water or the baptism or the rebirth, the Seth. And then over the third light, aeons were set up the seed of Seth. And in the third aeon were set up the seed of Seth. And so these are the children of Seth over the third light. But seed is not as in a flesh sense. It's in a spiritual sense. This is when Christ came and he said that he gave the parable of the sower and the seed. And he also talked about that the Jewish people and the Hebrews or the Gentiles and the Jewish were grafted together and they were no longer Jew or Gentile. And it's rather that you have gnosis and you follow the Christ that you become as either a Jew or Gentile or you become a Christ or you become a follower of Christ. So this is the seed of Seth, those that brought that took on the light that Seth brought into the New Age after the Old Testament. So all those after the Old Testament into the New Testament and forward, even into today, can be a seed of Seth. So it's, again, it's, you don't have to be a Hebrew, you don't have to be Jew to be a seed of Seth. Christ broke down those walls between races and uh, sects and all those things that separate people. The seed of Seth was over the third light. And then there's uh, Devatai, uh, which is the third light. And the holy souls were set up. And these are known as the holy souls. And notice they're not spirits, but rather they're souls. Because this is the bridgeway back to the Pleroma. The first one is the flesh, which is the also known as the highlight or the material person that has no understanding or interest in the spiritual realm or does not understand gnosis then there's those that have some understanding of the spiritual realm and maybe even possibly gnosis but are not on the walk and that's the holy souls they're on the bridge um, they may be at the beginning of the bridge or they beginning their walk across the bridge then you have of course like we talked about earlier which is under uh ario which is seth himself which carry the light which means they're doing the work to become a Christ Christo or Christino, and that's when they finally do arrive, they become a whole human being or a full or holy human being, and they enter into the area of Armazil, which is the perfect human, and that's when they go back to the Pleroma. And then getting back here, it says, in the fourth aeon were set up the souls of those who were ignorant, and so this is those that remain ignorant or just completely ignore anything spiritual. And they attach themselves to this realm and meaning to this realm. And they believe this is all there is. Or they believe in some other story about how there's death and there's a judgment. Uh, and you'll go to heaven or hell or something like that. Now these are people that just remain in ignorance about Gnosis and their understanding of fullness. Okay, um, so they're not able to really ever understand themselves and they'll never really fully understand the God in them. So they remain in ignorance. So in the fourth aeon were set up the souls of those who were ignorant of the fullness and did not repent immediately, but they persisted a while. Now, what does it mean by that? Again, I want to remind you because you've been taught through millennia that repentance refers to feeling wretched and sorrowful and horrible when nowhere in the Gnostic text nor in the Conical text says anything about feeling remorseful or, or shameful or guilty or feeling like you're a wretch because you did all these horrible things. Nothing like that. Repentance, again, goes back to the word from which we get the word penny. It means that you're paying the price, that you come to accept the price of what it means to go back to the Pleroma, which is you're going to have to give up your attachments to this realm. And so you know you're going to have to pay that back, which means you took on something that was never rightfully yours, um, and nor should it you want it to be rightfully yours ultimately. The only thing that you that it was rightfully yours is what you always had within you, but you couldn't accept it because it was so grand and great that the true Father loved you from the beginning. But you, through Sophia, you believed that you had to go through this process of suffering just to accept how much the true Father loved you. It was so overwhelming that you were even given the gift of life from the beginning that you you shunned yourself away from it. You couldn't you couldn't take it in. So you had to come here to prove to yourself that you were worthy to receive it. That's what repentance is. So when you're finally able to accept that you are worthy to receive it, then you'll be able to get it. You'll be able to buy it back, that light. So you never really own the darkness. The only thing the darkness does is an illusion to tell yourself you're worthy, when in fact you never needed to do that anyway. You always were worthy. So that's what repentance, that's why you're returning back to that. So it's called repentance. So these are the ones that don't repent immediately, meaning that everybody's going to eventually, right? They just don't do it immediately because it says, but they persisted. It doesn't say they persisted and that's it with a period, but it says, but they persisted a while period, which means that they're not going to be there forever. They're going to, they're going to finally get it. It's going to click in like train tracks, you know, going to another track, like click like that. 
And it doesn't matter if they're Buddhist or they're Hindu or they're proto-Orthodox Christian or they're Muslim or they're atheist or agnostic. Those don't matter because in the end, they're, everybody's going to get it and they're going to wake up in the, out of the Matrix like Neo in the movie Matrix. It's just going to happen, just the way it is. And after they repented, they dwelled beside the fourth light, Elilith. So these are the creatures who glorified the invisible spirit. And that's going to tell you another mystery when we talk about Revelations and the 24 creatures, right, that are uh, around the Demiurge's throne. And we'll, we'll get to that in another video, but right now we're getting a little lengthy in this video. But I wanted to just kind of summarize again that these are each one of the four lights that are expressing themselves through three different modalities, will, thought, and life. And each one of those modalities are equivalent to a power. Um, there's 12 powers, which are also the 12 zodiac signs in this realm. This is how we're experiencing these aeons right now in this realm. We're experiencing it through the astral theology. And each one of these attributes are gifts that we have. Some of us have strengths. Our greatest strength is also our potential greatest weakness uh, in this realm. For example, each one of the zodiac signs have their strengths. For example, when I had said grace is Taurus, Tauruses are more likely to be gracious people. But grace can also be their undermining if they're not careful. They're either too graceful and they can never, people will take advantage of them and overcome them. But one way to fight that is they have a resilience and capacity to be fixed in their in going where they want to go. And if they use that, then people won't take advantage of their gracefulness, so forth and so on. And each one of the signs are like that, is what I'm saying. So your strength or your gift can also be your weakness, but you want to use it to good effect. And your goal goal here is to learn how to maximize that incarnation that you have made a contract to come back to this realm because you're wanting to further understand your unique expression of God, which is called your name in the Pleroma, how you're recognized. And when you finally recognize that, then everybody in the Pleroma, all the aeons, the Christ, the Mother, Father will rejoice because they will see your face light up and they'll recognize you too. Not because they didn't recognize you from the beginning or always will and always, always have and always will, but because they they will recognize that you recognized it and they'll rejoice and welcome you back. And that's how it works. So we're going to go further in in the next uh, video and we're going to talk about how this was all set into motion by one of the aeons. And you probably know this if you have any understanding of Gnosticism whatsoever, but that aeon is known as Sophia. And you're going to understand that it's because of Sophia that all the experiences uh, that we're having uh, was uh, made possible. So this is not set up to be thought of as a fall or a mistake or an error or anything bad. In fact, it's the very opposite of that. And we're going to see that and we get into verse 10 of this incredible book. All right, we'll talk again soon. That's the day.